You are listening to The Gateway Church, located in Ferrisburg, Michigan. You can learn more about us by visiting thegateway.church or like and follow us on Facebook, where you can watch full services, keep up with all that is going on, and get connected. So, all right, let's go back. We're built to thrive. Everybody say, built to thrive. Built to thrive. This is a Holy Spirit-led uh, idea that the God just dropped in our hearts that as we grow as believers, we need uh, to understand that God has not created us just to exist or just to survive, just to make it. No, he wants us to be thriving. And this is a stewardship series. Uh, we are not uh, sugarcoating that. This is our walk with the Lord. This is Discipleship 101. Uh, Rick Warren said, that we mentioned this last week in, his, in The Purpose Driven Life, he said, our time on earth and our energy, our intelligence, our opportunities, relationships, and resources are all gifts from God that he has entrusted to our care and management. Last week, we ended the service with our hands like this. In fact, let's do that together. Hands out. Hands up like this. Hand, uh, palms up. This is a position the Lord kind of dropped in my heart, that this is the stewardship series that we can receive, but we also can give. We're not holding on. We, we, we're not, we're not protecting. No, we receive, but we also can give. This is what stewardship is. We are stewards of what God gives us. And when we back that up, and last week we said, all right, it starts with our purpose, why we exist. We, are, it, we exist to be a steward of what God has put in our hands. Colossians 1.16 says, for everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible, invisible, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. It's all about Jesus, our Heavenly Father. You and I were created by God for God. And until we grasp this, life will not make sense. So biblical stewardship is utilizing and managing all the resources God provides for the glory of God and the betterment of his creation. And if you're thinking, okay, it's a stewardship and it's all about money, listen, we took the big step last week. This is a huge jump. It's a radical departure to think, oh, stewardship is only money. No, stewardship is about everything. There's not an area in our life that is not affected by what we're going to be talking about from now through Easter. And the goal is that we would all become godly stewards. That's what we want. We want to be godly stewards. And when we talk about stewardship, it's representing and caring for something on behalf of someone else. That is on behalf of our Lord Jesus. And that means we're not the owner, right? Which is much different. We're mine, my, right? No, godly stewards have this reality or this recognition that God is the owner of everything and everyone on earth. We never really own anything. Now, that might be new information for some of you, and that is hard to understand. If you start running that through every part of your life, it is a huge departure from what the world would say. And this idea of being built to thrive is rooted there. See, God is inviting us into his way so we can thrive, not just exist, not just to survive. And with the promise, we will thrive. We'll find joy and contentment and freedom and peace and our purpose. Last week, we started with this idea of a seed. If you were with us, and a seed appears to be dead, right? It's in a dormant state. And we said, in order to thrive, we have to die. And we talked about our seven membership principles. There's two on each side. Uh, there's one, number one, and one, number seven. Uh, they, these are membership commitments. We give up our rights, and we also listen up to God. And those are important things. And that's not just because we're members uh, of the Gateway Church. It's because we're part of, the, of what God has called us to be. That's about being a believer, that we give up our rights, we listen up to God, and again, we hold things lightly, palms up. And this discipleship concept doesn't stop there. Also in membership class, we talk about the three T's, time, talent, 
and our treasure. That's, we're good at these things as, as Christians, right? It's like the three T's, the three F's, right? Food, fun, and fellowship. Yeah, you got it. Well, today, we're going to take the first of these three and take a first crack at it and look at stewarding our time and look at it through a biblical lens. And the great thing is when we start to dissect and we start to search in Scripture and say, all right, God, what do you say about time? There is an ancient treasure in regards to time and stewardship. It's actually a gift given to us so we can thrive. And today may be groundbreaking. It was certainly going to be counter cultural, goes against our fast-paced Western culture, and what we're going to talk about is found in the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 says this, remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Observing the Sabbath. You say, what in the world is Sabbath? Well, it means to take a break to take a day off, to rest. And actually, in the Hebrew, it just means stop. And if we look through the biblical lens about time, I think this is the perfect place where we should start. And I just want to warn you that once you sit through this service and get some understanding here, even if it's an early understanding or just the first time, you will have a decision whether you will follow what God's plan is for time or not. And uh, hopefully we'll follow it. Now, it's found in the uh, Ten Commandments. And when you look at it, the Ten Commandments, uh, they're, they're kind of listed. And this particular commandment is not just one little phrase. There is a slew of additional information. It's the only one that has a paragraph explaining what it means. Let's look at it. It says, remember the Sabbath uh, by day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. Pause. Who's he talking to? He's talking to God, his people, like the the Israelites, right? And he says, this includes you. Turn to your neighbor and say, this includes includes you, right? It includes you, your sons, your daughters, your males and your female servants, your livestock and any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them, but the seventh day he rested, he stopped. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. God's gift to mankind related to time is the Sabbath, and it's found in the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments are a list of things that, uh, that we should follow, right? There's certain things to do or not to do. And if we don't follow those, couldn't we all agree that there would be a diminishing effect in our life, that it would affect us in a negative way? Well, the principle of Sabbath is that one in seven, you stop and you rest, and again, it's a gift, This is what you need to do, is what God is saying, the Ten Commandments. And so let's just put it through the ringer. If you put other gods before him, before our Heavenly Father, how many know that doesn't work so good, right? If you fail or if you fall into idol worship, right, it's just not going to work out. If you covet your neighbor's stuff, it doesn't work out. If you don't honor your father and mother, it doesn't work out. The idea is if you break these laws, or I would say these gifts, they will hurt you. One in seven is holy, set apart to rest, to Sabbath, to stop. And if we don't do it, it's just not going to go as well. There's a diminishing effect in our lives, and we'll talk about that. This is really from the very get-go. God created the heavens and the earth, six days of creation. On the seventh day, he rested. Look at it, Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. It says, on the seventh day, he finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of 
creation. So from the very beginning of time, this was this pattern. It was God's pattern. Did he need to rest? Probably not. But he knew he was going to create us in his image. And he says, hey, this is the model to follow. So we see that the Ten Commandments in Exodus. There's another place in Scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 5 that the Ten Commandments are listed. And there, there's some additional information that caught my attention last year about Sabbath. And I want to read it. It says this, remember. This is right. So it says, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy, all the things that we read in Exodus. And then it also adds, remember that you were once slaves in Egypt, but the Lord your God brought you out with his strong hand and powerful arm. This is why the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. You might be like, well, what it, why would that be added in the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy's? Well, when we were studying EHS and EHR, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality and Relationships, uh, we, we learned about Sabbath last spring. Uh, Pastor Bobby and I did. Uh, we were in a class together, and it was interesting. There, there was the, like the light bulb came on. For 400 years, God's people were slaves in Egypt, Right? 400 years, they were not even viewed as people. They were seen as property. And how many know there is a dehumanizing effect when we just work, 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 and never take a break? Because we're not machines. When we don't stop, when we don't rest, it will frustrate our lives. Again, there's this diminishing effect. And so for 400 years, and now the children of Israel are set free, and God says, this is the command. Take one day in seven. You are my people. This is a gift to you. Follow my ways. But if we don't, how many know? I've heard this before, and I've experienced it myself. I'll share the story, that if we don't Sabbath, Sabbath will be imposed on us. It can be. I was a few years back, we were in the middle of a building pro- process here, and um, it was stressful. Let me just say, it was, there was a lot of work, a lot of, a lot of thought, a lot of, a lot of things going on, and um, I ended up, ended up coming down with shingles. And uh, if you know anything about shingles, it's stress-related, right? And uh, it, it's just, it is what it is. And I'm at my house, and I'm literally laying on the couch, and I get a call from a friend, he says, man, I really feel like I've got a word from the Lord. And, uh, and some of you heard this before. But, uh, and, he says, and, and he says, can I come over? I'm like, well, I guess so. <laughs> and so uh, he comes over, and, he, and one of the things he said is that I didn't know how to rest well. And he was right. And it caught up with me. Because there's more to life than just labor and work, work, work. Unfortunately, it takes time to receive strength and peace from the Lord, and we need Sabbath rest. So will you have a happy Sabbath or an unhappy Sabbath? Because if we only work and never stop, I can guarantee you, according to Scripture, our relationships, our marriages, our kids will all suffer. We will, can lose our health. There can be sickness. There are other things. We will suffer. Now, for me, growing up in the church, I don't remember hearing about Sabbath. Uh, I probably did at one point or another, but I don't remember it sinking in. And so I move into adulthood, and I am uh, kind of this way anyway, but it was like, go, 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 go. Um, I, I, Jessica and I, we got married. I was 19 years old. Uh, she was 20. Our first year combined income was $12,000 together, uh, taxable income. And I mean, we were on the bottom. We were always blessed, always had uh, enough, but uh, it was tight. And, uh, but anyway, I had a good work ethic. My dad uh, taught me to work. Work is under the Lord. And, and so I'm like, man, uh, I got my first position out of college. And uh, I was a kid's pastor, not making a ton of money. And I, they gave me a day off. But I'm thinking to myself, to myself, well, it's another day. I can work and add to the, to the, uh, to the finances. And so literally, for the first two or three years, I worked every uh, one of my days off with an industrial plumber from the church. And quick story, uh, I literally, I had two jobs. I, one of two things I did. I would either uh, 
man a, a jackhammer, and I was busting up concrete, or I was shoveling pea gravel, and I would work on Monday, I'd be sore until Friday, and then next Monday, I'd do it all again. <laughs> and I never could get my muscles to like, it just, every week, it just, it just killed me. But, uh, but anyway, uh, but I was like, okay, that just was the thing. And then I ended up starting to sell, buy and sell cars, and some of you know that story, and God really blessed that, and uh, so that was fruitful, but I was doing that on my day off. Uh, and even if I wasn't uh, working on my day off, the entire, my entire adult life until last spring, I literally would make a list. The longer the list, the better. 10, 12, 20 things. I didn't care. The more I could, things I could do on my day off, I was thinking I was making progress. I was getting ahead. That that was a successful day off. Now, the reason I tell you this is I ended up on my first sabbatical in 2016. So eight years ago now, in an eight to ten week break, I didn't know what I was doing, so I hired a sabbatical coach, which was a good idea. And long story short, the big takeaway from that entire time, and, and this is, and I don't remember where I got this, but I hope I never forget it, is that when we rest, God continues the work. That was the big understanding throughout that sabbatical. And I remember coming back after sabbatical, and the church had actually grown and was healthier and stronger because I had taken an eight- or ten-week uh, break um, in 2016. You say, why are you talking about this? Well, that was 2016. I get this revelation that when we rest, God continues. It was two years later we are building. I get shingles. I'm on my back. And I'm having to learn again, a friend of mine, when I'm down and out, saying, hey, you don't know how to rest well. I hadn't learned my lesson. It's a continual learning. And what's interesting is this week, I met with a sabbatical coach for the first time. I'm planning to take sabbatical this summer. Our leadership team is uh, going to bless my family again uh, with that. And we're super excited for, about that. But as I'm meeting with my sabbatical coach, and he's just getting to know me, and he, and he said, hey, what is God doing? What, what is the Lord speaking? And I reminded him, or I told him about my biggest revelation in 2023 last year was from last spring going through this class I was telling you about where I really felt like the Lord was saying I needed to strive less and let God do more. And I've shared that a little bit. And the sabbatical coach says, it seems like there's a pattern here. <laughs> like you need to continue to learn. And he says, that's just interesting. Let's mark that. That I need to learn to strive less. It's not all about work. Let God do more. And I didn't say this for service till the very end, but I'm going to add it here. Um, when I got that understanding last spring, I kind of drew a line in the sand. Jessica, you remember when it happened? Some of the team can remember because I, I would come in. I'd be like, man, this is hard. I started taking my full day off, and I started not doing anything. I didn't do any yard work. I wasn't uh, working on projects. I literally was uh, spending time with the Lord. I might watch a movie. I might take a nap, eat your best food, and uh, you know, be with people you love. And what was crazy is there was a direct correlation last year. Uh, we came into the year flat, uh, and uh, we weren't actually even hitting budget as a church. And all of the ministry staff, um, all of our ministry budgets, we were living at 50%. Uh, all of our team got paid the entire time. That wasn't the issue, but uh, all of our expendable income, we were living on 50%. And uh, when I made this line in the sand, and I, I, just, I just see it as God's hand and His, his way, uh, I said, all right, I'm going to take my day off, and I don't care. And as much as I struggled through it, I would be frustrated. I feel so unproductive, and uh, it's been just crazy for my mind. But when I decided to do that, to strive less, let God do more, you know what? God started to do more. Our finances turned around, and we, could, we started growing again. And I would say by the end of the last year, we are at where we were before COVID or maybe even a little ahead in regards to attendance. And to God be the glory. And I'm doing less. 
what's the problem? We got to keep moving. It's busyness, right? We all struggle. The hurry, the pace of life. Technology is not going to slow down. In the book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer, uh, it's a fa- fascinating book. I've read it a couple times over the last couple years. There's a chapter called The History of Speed, and the amount of speed and the way that our lives are moving is ridiculous compared to 50, 100, or hundreds of years previous. It's causing us to not sleep well. No wonder people are exhausted all the time. And the problem is, in order for us to grow in discipleship and to be good stewards, uh, to grow, it takes time. John Mark Comer, in that book, he says, people are just too busy to live emotionally healthy and spiritually rich and vibrant lives. That should grip us. I want you to just take a second and read this to yourself. Actually, I'll read it again. People are just too busy to live emotionally healthy and spiritually rich and vibrant lives. Let that sink in. Is that your story? We're talking about time and stewardship and busyness. It almost has become this badge of honor. We're running our kids from here to there. We're filling our schedules with in no margin. It's the American way. When you ask someone how they're doing, oh, I'm busy, and it's like that's like our normal answer. Can we just er- eliminate that from our vocabulary, please? Because it's not a God principle. Eugene Peterson says busyness is the enemy of spirituality. The problem is time and the hurry in the hustle and bustle. And there's a huge list of issues that when we're in a hurry, when we're busy, over busy, it can cause all kinds of things. I've got a list here and I've got a couple pages here. I'm just going to hit the highlights. Irritability is the first one that came to mind. You get mad, you get frustrated, uh, you just get annoyed too easily. People have to tiptoe around you. You're negative, uh, just all those things. Irritability. How about hypersensitivity? A minor comet can hurt you. Uh, minor things can escalate into big emotional events. Restlessness, when you, uh, do, uh, when you try to slow down and you try to rest and you're like, I can't. You give Sabbath a try and it's like, nah, it's, I hate this. It's, it's not working. Uh, our busyness also can cause issues of workaholism, just never being willing to stop. Emotional numbness, our priorities get out of place, a lack of self-care, our sleep, our exercise, our food, you fill in the blank. When we get over busy and we're hurried, uh, escapism uh, behaviors can creep in, overeating, over drinking, binge watching, uh, social media, pornography. When you get over busy and your life is all about the hurry, it, it, your spiritual disciplines can slip. Scripture, prayer, rest, these are big challenges for us, for all of us. Isolation, disconnected to God, to with others, even with your own soul, it's a huge issue. There's lots of things we could talk about. The bottom line is, Hurry or busyness kills relationships. Busyness kills joy, gratitude, appreciation. People in a rush do not have time to enter into the goodness of a moment. John Mark Comer in that book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, he says, hurry kills all that we hold dear. Our spirituality, our health, our marriage, our family, Thoughtful work, creativity, generosity. He says, you name the value, hurry kills. Hurry is the sociopathic predator loose in our society. Does that sink in? Does that resonate? I I think there's some truth there. Corey Ten Boone says, if the devil can't make you sin, he will make you busy. So sin and busyness both cut off or cannot make or, or cut off your connection with God and others and even with ourselves. Satan doesn't want you to surrender in this area of stewarding your time and considering a Sabbath. 
But if we don't stop, if we don't Sabbath, if we don't rest, if we don't do this, we will lose. You will never have full joy or peace or perspective. There will be a diminishing return on your life if you don't Sabbath. And spiritually, we will never have enough energy to catch back up if we don't stop. So, what's the solution? Well, the first thing I would say is that the solution is not that we need more time, right? No. The solution is that we need to trust God's perspective. What does he say about time? What is his plan for us? What is his pattern? We imitate God by stopping our work and resting. When we Sabbath, we're saying, okay, our bodies, our brains, our spirits, our emotions are all wired by God for these rhythms to work and then to rest, to work and then to rest. Therefore, we don't stop when, we, when the work is done. Otherwise, we might never stop, right? We stop or Sabbath out of obedience to our Heavenly Father. And when we do so, I like what Wayne Mueller says, that we get the chance to experience our relative unimportance. <laughs> Isn't that so true? When we put our lives in all of eternity, in this period of time that we're living, we honor our limitations and we get to enjoy our relative unimportance. So how does it work? There's a lot of different ways. You can look at Sabbath. You can uh, Google it. And there's, there's all kinds of different lists. I want to just talk about three things real quick. Number one is you stop working. Sabbath actually means to stop. And so we stop our work. We stop anything that causes physical exhaustion. Any hurriedness, we stop. We slow down. We stop multitasking. We stop anything competitive. We, even important decisions, we put a halt. We catch up on errands. No! We stop. We stop even our technology, if you're so bold to do so. Number one, you start by stopping. You also not only stop your work, you stop your wanting. Buying and selling would be included. The hustle and bustle, finances, uh, those types of things. Uh, it was interesting. Jessica and I were, had a chance to go to New York this fall, and uh, we were there on a Saturday. And uh, I wanted to go and, and do some watch shopping. And there's a, there, between Fifth Avenue and Times Square, there's a place or a street called the Diamond District. And it was a Saturday. And a lot of Jewish people, I guess, uh, must own those because about 90% of the stores were closed on a Saturday. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, this is ridiculous. But they figured it out. They don't buy and sell, uh, and uh, it, it, we should do the same. But we stop our work, we stop our wanting, and then third, could we be so bold to stop worry? The Bible says to be anxious for nothing, right? Depression, anxiety, worry is rampant in this day and age. It's a fact. Could it be that part of the solution could be that we should stop and rest and Sabbath? I don't know. When we think about stop worrying, it's more than just uh, stopping our physical work. It's our emotions and our mental health to do the hard work around those things as well. Just take a break. Rest in who God has created us to be. So again, we're not doing taxes. We're not doing our budgets. We're not creating to-do lists. We're not making major decisions. All of those things should be saved for another time. The goal of Sabbath is to replenish our spirits, to rest our bodies, to delight in the Lord, to contemplate, to rest our souls. We are not doing machines. Instead, we're deeply loved children of God, sons and daughters. God delights in us. And because of that, he provides free time once a week so we can replenish.
It's a gift. It's a gift from God. Sabbath is, is designed to protect our bodies from wearing out, to protect our souls from burning out, to protect our spirits from tuning out. You say, why is that so important? Well, because we're so busy, what happens is the voice of God gets softer and softer. But I believe as we engage in Sabbath, the voice of God can get louder and louder and louder. So the struggle, though, today and I've really wrestled with this, is that today is 1 in 52. And today's a snow day, and we got, you know, a fraction of what people are here uh, in person. And I know we got a ton online, and we're so grateful for you. But the, the thing I've wrestled with is, okay, I'm going to share this talk, right? People are going to listen, and the majority may go back to their busy life. But can we just acknowledge for a second that God might be trying to get your attention? What if you changed your pattern, your perspective, and followed God's plan in regards to stopping? If we were going to do that, we would have to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives. And understand that Sabbath is so radical and extreme in the day-to-day. People won't understand. Your coworkers won't understand. Your friends, uh, your kids' friends won't understand. It cuts to the core of our spirituality, the core of our convictions, the core of our faith, the core of our lifestyle to really Sabbath. But the gift is here. It's God's plan for you and for me. And the crazy thing is that our culture knows nothing of setting aside a whole day to rest and to delight in God. And the truth might be that most of us have probably considered it an optional command. Not something absolutely essential to discipleship. But I have found since last spring and working forward, and I pray that I'll never go back, that it's an important, critical part of my own spiritual walk to remember the command. I'm going to ask the, the team to come. And we're, what, I, what I just have on my heart is that as we think about this topic, my heart is that we would not just hear and say, oh, man, that was good, or, man, that's something to think about, but that we really wrestle And I understand that the thought of like, all right, I'm just going to move forward and my life is going to be different. Listen, let's not think a month or two months down the line. Let's talk about one week. In the next seven days, my challenge is that you try this. To stop, to Sabbath, to rest. And just see. And you might hate it. You might feel totally unproductive like I have. But know this, that we were not created to just do, do, do. No. God created us for relationship with him. And by the way, what we do doesn't really even matter to God so much. He loves us unconditionally, and he just wants to spend some time with us. And so would you try this radical, this ancient gift of Sabbath? I hope so. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And Pastor Bobby, you can close us out for this morning. Let's stand and let's just continue to sit in uh, the presence of God for a moment before we move into our last song. Or maybe let's uh, also have that posture that we talked about last week of having open hands, offering God our lives, our time, and receiving rest in return. Let's just sit in his presence for a moment before we continue on today.
anytime I get caught in a moment where I am unable to rest, where I feel frantic or like I'm just, just running, 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 running and unable to stop. Um, a couple years ago, uh, God kind of dropped this question in my mind. Now, anytime that it happens again, I, I bring this question up again and it's, what are you running from? Maybe you're running from uh, a sin or maybe you're running from just yourself feeling worthless or, or self-loathing or hatred or, or feeling pressure from others, uh, whether it's, you know, your neighbors or society or your friends. But so many times if I ask myself, what am I running from? It, it shows me just what I, I need to surrender to God in order to just rest and find my rest in him. And so, again, I want us to close our eyes uh, before um, I pray us out and just maybe ask yourself, what am I running from? If I feel like I can't stop, like I'm busy, what are we running from? Lord, we thank you for your gift of time. Lord, that we don't know the days of our lives, but you have numbered them. And Lord, we thank you for them. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be good stewards of our time, learn how to rest in you and find our, our purpose and our identity in you, Lord. And Lord, I know that it, there are times where stewarding these other two things, our, our treasure and our talent is linked to our time, Lord, that there are, are moments where I feel like I don't have enough, like I need to have more, gain more, do more, Lord. And in those moments, help me to know that you are the Lord of my treasure. Help me to steward those things well, to steward my time, Lord. Lord, and I know that there are also moments where I want to be more, where I want to do everything and be everything to everyone, Lord. Lord, remind me of my limits, that I'm not gifted in everything, nor can I do everything. Lord, that as soon as I complete a goal, that there will just be more goals that I'll set for myself, Lord. Help me to learn to steward my talents, to better steward my time. Lord, and let me just be reminded that you are God, that you are in control, that you are good. And so I can surrender these things to you, that I don't need to be in control of everything, that I don't need to do everything, that I don't need to have everything. Lord, help me to surrender my time to you. Help me to remember that I was not made to work, but I was made to worship Lord, and let me and all of us leave this place being people free from the burden of doing more, the burden of, of society to have more or to be like other people. Let us walk out of here with our purpose being found in you. Lord, my prayer echoes the prayer of St. Augustine that my heart is restless until it finds rest in you. Help us to find our rest in you. We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Thank you so much for being with us today. Go in the grace of God. Be safe and warm out there. We'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to this week's message from the Gateway Church. If you'd like to find out more about our church, such as service times, giving, and ways to get connected, visit us at thegateway.church.